This afternoon's guest is the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Judge Ginsburg's legal career and education began at this school, where she attended for two years before moving on to Columbia. She has a daughter who, like many of us here, is now learning the law, and she attends Columbia. The judge's teaching credentials include professorships at Rutgers School of Law and at Columbia. Judge Ginsburg and her husband, the HLS visiting Professor Ginsburg, both taught at Columbia until her appointment to the bench in 1980. Mr. Ginsburg is a professor of law at Georgetown. Judge Ginsburg has involved herself in a wide variety of additional activities beyond her uh, work now um, at the court with the ABA and women's issues, arguing many of the most important sex, sex discrimination cases. Indeed, before her appointment to the bench during the 1970s, she is reputed to have argued more cases than anyone but the Solicitor General in her capacity as general counsel to the ACLU. And it is my pleasure to present to you now the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Thank you for that very cordial introduction. And just one correction. My daughter, the lawyer, graduated from this law school in 1980 and will start teaching law at Columbia Law School, the law school from which I graduated, in the spring term of 1987. And my husband, who was a visiting professor at this law school for this term only, is seated in the back row. <laughs> When the forum first called me, it was suggested that I might talk about Harvard Law School's medieval days, the middle 1950s, when as a timid 1L, I sat in a Langdell or an Austin classroom, although this one looks a lot better than I remember it, <laughs> in the company of just one other woman and over a hundred men. The change when I survey this group is gratifying. But some of my former law teaching colleagues look back on the 50s with a certain longing. A grand master of the Socratic dialogue at Columbia made this observation. Until the 1970s, when the class was moving slowly and his queries were greeted with a series of unprepareds, the solution was ever at hand. Call on the woman. She was always prepared. She could be relied upon for a crisp, bright answer nine times out of ten. But these days, the Columbia professor laments, there is no difference. The women, secure that equal opportunity is now the law, are as unprepared as the men. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have spoken many times at Harvard and in other places about signs once all over the legal profession, no women wanted, women need not apply, and the social change that brought those signs down. A great lady who died just two days ago, Simone de Beauvoir, helped stimulate a revival of feminist consciousness in me and in many other people in the law and in many other fields worldwide through her remarkable book, first published in 1949, The Second Sex. At the end of this afternoon's talk, I would be glad to entertain questions of what I have witnessed about the changing roles and responsibilities of men and women in the legal profession. But for now, I turn to the announced topic, and I will try to take you by the hand for a guided tour inside the Federal Courts of Appeals, and particularly the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. I will concentrate most heavily on how we arrive at and write up our dispositions. 
The D.C. Circuit, typical of federal courts in this respect, houses a hot bench. That means that before oral argument or court conference, we individually warm up on the array of 15 to 20 cases, our clerk's office packages for panels several weeks in advance of each month's sitting periods. Generally, we commence preparation for a civil case by reading the decision attacked on appeal, the district court's judgment, or the agency's rule or adjudication. We next approach the briefs. We do that in an attitude best described as hopeful skepticism. Particularly if the case is complex, we may consult before turning to the party's writings a law clerk's bench memo, digesting or excerpting key portions of the record. If it is well done, the bench memo should enable us to speed read the briefs. Judges differ in their calls for bench memos. Some judges, typically new judges, but not invariably new, want bench memos in every case. Others rarely want them at all and prefer night before argument warm-up sessions with their clerks. Still others skip memos in the easy cases, as I do, but depend on them for appeals of heavier weight. The hope is for crisp briefs offering only arguments judges can reasonably be asked to buy, develop logically in sentences and paragraphs that one can grasp on first reading. The reality too often is an unrefined presentation, one containing much chaff or filling that my colleague Judge Abner J. Mikva has said some lawyers foolishly regard as harmless surplus. Occasionally, hope for the brief is not in vain, and now and then we do receive a brief of Ames Prize-winning quality. But even when a brief is a finely composed product, we remain skeptical. That attitude is endemic to the judge's trade. Skepticism stems in substantial part from the value we place on getting it right. The law we identify and apply is not cast for one day and one case alone. We cannot rely entirely on today's parties to define law that will touch tomorrow's controversies. We are obliged to pursue an independent inquiry. But there are constraints on our zeal to get it right. One of them is fairness to the parties. Judges in our court, aided enormously by law clerks, make home reports and services a lawyer left untouched or research treatises and law reviews the lawyer did not consult. But the lawyers know the universe of information we might read. They are at least aware of the existence of material that time or other cause led them to skip. Suppose then that instead of or along with dispatching law clerks to library shelves and computer terminals, I phone up Professor Sage, a claimed expert in an arcane field, and ask how she would resolve my hard case. That is out of bounds. It would be off the record and outside the realm of published material accessible to the litigants. Even if I exposed the consultation to the parties and invited their comment, suspicion would cling that the loser faced a stacked debt. I recall in this regard Professor Paul Freund's remark about one of the giants of the D.C. Circuit, Judge Howard Leventhal, who served on our court from 1965 until his death in 1979. Professor Freund said Judge Leventhal would call on the telephone to talk about a lecture he would give quite frequently, but never, never did he call and speak about a case. 
while I may not bring up Professor Sage to talk about a case, because that would tarnish the appearance of fairness, there is a certain irony in the access I have at all times to three bright law clerks, one or more of them perhaps students of Professor Sage. I encourage my law clerks' comments and their attempts to influence or change my mind. Conversations with one's own staff, though off the record, is entirely within accepted bounds. I might add at this point that in relation to our cloistered life, the transition from academia to the bench, the turn I took, seems to me considerably easier than the change from work as a busy law practitioner or a legislator. Teachers are accustomed to working alone, spending hours on end at a desk, reading, thinking, and writing. Colleagues who once thrived on a bustling day may experience malaise, adjusting to the isolation of a judge's chambers. In most cases calendared in the DC circuit, the judges move directly from preparation in their individual chambers to the courtroom session at which oral argument occurs. Our calendars, I should explain, are arranged so that in each of the year's several sitting periods, a judge sits with a different set of colleagues. In the DC circuit, each member of the court will sit with every other member for at least one week in the court's annual, at least eight cycle term. Our system allows virtually no room for judge shopping by the litigants or case assignment steering on the part of the judges. In contrast to the enduring brief, oral argument in our court is fleeting. We generally allow not the generous half hour per side in your moot court arguments, but 15 or 20 minutes is our standard sometimes only 10. We take arguments, but we don't transcribe them. In some circuits, the written briefs are all the court will receive in a very high percentage of appeals. My DC circuit colleagues value the face-to-face -face encounter with counsel, and we have thus far resisted what is a marked trend to dispense with oral argument in a very high percentage of cases. In the D.C. Circuit, we dispose of no more than 10% of our decided cases without oral argument. In the 5th and 11th Circuit, by contrast, just about half the cases presented for decision, the ones that don't settle out, are resolved without any oral argument at all. Oral argument, as I see it, is in most cases a hold-the-line operation for counsel not as important as the brief, but a significant ground-retaining exercise. In close to six years of appellate judging, I have seen only two victories snatched at oral argument from a total defeat. All three panelists, it later emerged, had firmly anticipated prior to argument. But I have seen a number of probable winners based on the written submissions, shift to become losers because of clarification elicited at argument. I have learned to listen at argument as much to my colleagues as to the advocates. Colleagues' questions may alert me to concerns of other judges that I should address at conference or ultimately in an opinion. D.C. Circuit judges all have their chambers in the same building. Even so, except in cases of enormous bulk or extraordinary sensitivity, panel members generally do not meet or even phone each other to discuss a case before the scheduled argument. Burdened by an imposing caseload and a sometimes dreadfully large paper flow, coming every day, 
the judge next door may not have gotten around to the case until the eve before argument. We do confer to reach tentative decisions directly after a morning's arguments, often without pausing for lunch, or to compare notes and impressions with our law clerks and chambers. Decision conferences are attended only by the judges and only by the judges on the panel. No one except those judges may participate in or even audit the conference and our discussions are not recorded. The immediacy of our decision conference following up the argument <coughs> without a break indicates how important advanced preparation is for the judge who wishes to have a say in how the case will come out. One cannot vote intelligently and certainly not hope to persuade colleagues without a thorough grasp on the day's cases. Our conferences are informal. It is our custom to hear first from a judge on senior status or a visiting judge if we have one on the panel, then from the active circuit judges in reverse order of seniority. We take up the day's argued or submitted cases one by one. Each judge reports how she or he is inclined to rule and why. Most of our conferences are brief. I had anticipated more in the way of exchange with colleagues in relation to decisions than in fact occurs. There are exceptions. Five of my courts, currently 11 active judges, soon perhaps to be six of 12, and one of the senior judges, Judge McGowan, were once full-time law teachers. A panel, including two or three law teachers, can be as spirited in conference as it is in asking questions at argument. Some lawyers, I'm told, have dubbed our court the Court of Appeals for the Academic Circuit. If we had less business, I might favor pre-argument meetings, at least in the more complex cases. With our current caseload and backlog, as I suggested, even the most diligent judge sometimes does not get through the piled briefs of the parties, interveners, and amici, and the requested law clerk bench memos ahead of the last pre-argument hour. We exchange no written statements of position on the merits of a case in advance of the decision conference. Here, something other than time is at stake. The concern is that an initial view committed to paper and circulated before collegial discussion might acquire a permanence it does not deserve. Retreat, accommodation, compromise, my colleagues believe, is more readily achieved when one's starting position is advanced only in conversation. Our modus operandi tugs us very strongly toward the middle. In contrast to district court judges, who are lords in their fiefdoms, no single court of appeals judge can ever carry the day in any case. To attract a second vote and establish durable law for the circuit, a judge may find it necessary to moderate her own position, sometimes to be less bold, other times to be less clear. Unheralded by a press fond of separating liberals from conservatives, relatively few court of appeals decisions generally and relatively few DC circuit decisions in particular elicit dissent. Nearly all of our unpublished judgments and about 85% of our published opinions issue without a dissent. In preparation for this talk, I checked my own six-year record for corroboration. It shapes up this way. I have disagreed most often with Judge George E. McKinnon. He is labeled deeply conservative. We have parted company 14 times, 
In eight cases, he dissented from my opinion for the court, and in three cases, I dissented from his. Three other times, we were on the same side, but for different reasons. Despite our differences, I hasten to add, I am exceedingly fond of Judge McKinnon, and I appreciate particularly the pride he takes in the achievements of his daughter, law professor Catherine McKinnon, who is not deeply conservative. <laughs> Next on my difference of opinion list, two friends labeled liberal. Judge, a soon-to-be chief judge of our court, Patricia M. Wald, and Judge Abner J. Mikva. We have disagreed six times. After that, the drop-off is precipitous. I have disagreed in print with some colleagues twice, with others only once, and there is one colleague, the prince of our court, Judge Carl McGowan, with whom I have never disagreed. Responsibility to write decisions is divided among the panelists at the post-argument conference. Inform the presiding judge, the most senior active judge on the panel, makes the assignment, but in practice, the division is generally made by agreement. We aim for a more or less even allocation so that each member of the panel will carry back to chambers from the sitting period a fair share of the writing workload. For each case considered at conference, we decide together what form the disposition will take. In the D.C. Circuit, decisions come in five flavors. All are public, but not all are published. Opinions under the author's name prepared for publication in the federal reporter system. Then, procuring opinions, also for federal reporter publication, going to the other end of the scale, unadorned judgments, telling little more than who won and who lost, speaking judgments, judgments that offer a summary accounting for the result, one or more citations or sentences to explain the decision, and then judgments accompanied by short memorandum, a roughly one to six double-spaced type pages. Those memoranda, like the unadorned speaking judgments, are not designed for federal reporter publication. They set no precedent, but they do inform the parties and the tribunal from which the appeal was taken in some but not great detail why we ruled as we did. In the 1980s, the D.C. Circuit has issued opinions for federal reporter publication in at least 55% of the circuit's decided cases. Among the circuits, that is a rather high proportion. Some issue the majority of their decisions as unpublished dispositions. That form of disposition issues swiftly and it saves time for the judges. It also conserves space in the federal reporter system. But there is an unsettling question. It is whether cases resolved in that manner by unpublished disposition are in fact decided with sufficient care and hard thought. Published per curiam opinions have a variety of uses. The court may style an opinion that way because it wishes to make a sharp statement that it finds the merits one-sided an opinion of that kind ordinarily consumes little judge time. But a large opinion may also come out per curiam. The panel may divide the labor two or three ways on a big case and label the joint product per curiam. In addition, we may decide to issue an opinion per curiam to underscore the panel's unanimity in a specially sensitive or noteworthy case. I can think a couple of years ago of the telephone access charge case when our circuit approved what is now the addition that you find on every telephone bill. Uh, no one judge wanted to take the flack for that alone, so that is a bulky per curiam opinion. 
It may be, too, that the opinion is highly critical of the behavior of the district judge or of another official, and all of us want to stand solidly behind the strong words. The presiding judge at a D.C. Circuit panel conference promptly notifies our clerk's office of the form in which the day's cases will be decided and the judge responsible for preparing the decision. The notice sent to the clerk's office facilitates our internal accounting. Each month we have a meeting of the full court. High on the meeting agenda is the statement for each judge of writing assignments still on his or her work table. If too many cases are on a judge's work in progress list too long, that judge may be asked by colleagues to stop sitting until he or she catches up. Because of our 1985 and 1986 caseload crunch, we have lately tabled our stop sitting and catch up rule. We need all hands to fill our sitting panels. The Administrative Procedure Act empowers us sometimes to compel agency action unlawfully held, withheld, or unreasonably delayed. We should apply that stricture to the home team first. Our court cannot in good conscience tell the NLRB or the FLRA or the FDA or OSHA to speed up when several cases argued to us in 1982 remain undecided. Just a few remarks on preparation of opinions. A judge engaged in writing an opinion for the court operates under several constraints. The record defines and limits the facts and circumstances with which she may deal. The party's contentions ordinarily determine the issues to be addressed. If the panel or the opinion writer spots a potentially dispositive question not raised by the parties, the judges generally invite supplemental briefs, thereby affording the litigants a chance to have their say. The author of an opinion is, of course, guided or restrained by precedent in the federal courts of appeals, always by the Supreme Court's decisions and the published decisions of the writer's own circuit. No three-judge panel in a circuit is at liberty to depart from the published decision of a prior panel of that circuit. The law of our circuit may be altered only by the court sitting in bank. In our circuit, a case can be embanked only if an absolute majority of the active judges votes for full court adjudication. Currently, with 11 active judges, embank hearing requires six affirmative votes. We do have a simplified procedure when a panel detects an inconsistency in existing circuit precedent. We call it the Irons footnote. The panel circulates its opinion to the full court, highlighting for special attention the apparent conflict between previously decided cases. If no judge objects to the panel's resolution of the conflict, the panel declares the issue settled and footnotes the full court's agreement. We are strongly influenced by decisions of other circuits, and we do not, without very weighty reason, create a circuit split. In the D.C. Circuit, every decision that will appear in the Federal Reporter, once approved by the panel, is circulated to the full court at least a week before the opinion is released. That is a means of avoiding both intra- and inter-circuit conflict. As to intra-circuit conflict, just now, for example, three different panels are wrestling with a similar question concerning organizational standing. When the first panel opinion circulates, judges and their law clerks on the other panels may be expected to read the circulated opinion with acute interest. Any judge who thinks the panel's decision is wrong or bears improvement can so advise the panel. But if the panel won't budge, the only avenue the non-panelist has to block release of the decision is to garner six votes 
for in bank consideration before the opinion issues. I have never seen that happen. If we know that a proposed decision departs from another circuit's precedent, we flag the conflict at the time of full court circulation and any judge of our circuit can then suggest further consideration. I emphasized earlier that a circuit judge's inability to order anything alone moves the judge toward moderation and away from startlingly creative or excessively rigid positions. Judge Henry Friendly once observed that in most appellate cases, the governing law is already made and not genuinely debatable. When a case does invite a decision moving forward or setting back the development of the law, the odds heavily favor the little against the much. The prospect of a dissent or a separate concurring statement pointing out an opinion's inaccuracies or inadequacies heightens the author's incentive to get it right or at least to keep it tight. Even when an opinion survives panel inspection and circulation to the full court, it may be exposed post-release to a further in-house review when the losing party petitions for rehearing and bank. The check exerted by colleagues keeps a Court of Appeals judge from veering too far out of line, but it does have its downside. As Chief Judge Hughes is said to have commented, I always try to write my opinions logically and clearly. But if a justice whose vote is necessary to make a majority insists that particular language be put in, in it goes, and let the law reviews figure out what it means. <laughs> to what extent do colleagues in fact seek alteration in one another's opinions? Some judges hardly ever do and are themselves comment resistant. Others advance suggestions generously and may even genuinely welcome suggested changes in return. Some judges are more prone to receive than to give suggestions. Close comments or suggestions on a colleague's opinion take time away from the judge's own writing assignments. The job sometimes is, but in my judgment should not be, turned over to a law clerk, at least not without careful supervision and review by the judge. One tends to bridle, the judge does, at comments purportedly from a colleague on the court loaded with words like doctrinal or tests of two or three prongs. Those tests clearly reveal their authorship. Comments are generally dispatched by memorandum, but occasionally judges sit down together or connect by telephone to work out mutually acceptable positions and adjust the shape of a page paragraph or phrase. Up to the moment I left for the airport this morning, Judge Bork and I were fiddling over a footnote, which I think will be very fine. <laughs> Separate statements, even dissents, may be warded off in this way. How great is the part law clerks play? Justice Brandeis believed that Supreme Court justices commanded public respect because they do their own work. In his day, federal courts had fewer cases and federal judges had no more than one law clerk. Nowadays, most Supreme Court justices have four law clerks and most Court of Appeals judges have three. We depend on our clerks often totally for the heavy research many of our cases demand. Well, that statement bears clarification. We have on our court talented hands in diverse fields. Judge Edwards, for example, is well acquainted with the literature and labor law. Judge Scalia with administrative law commentary. I taught civil procedure for many years, and I do not send law clerks off to wander rudderless through Wright and Miller's sections on, say, venue. Judge Bork can point to the clear thinking one can find in the antitrust paradox. 
How much actual opinion writing do law clerks do? It depends on the character of the case, the habits and work appetite of the judge, and the skill of the clerk. Under instructions from the judge, many clerks nowadays, I believe most clerks, do produce at least first drafts for the judge to revise. Sometimes the judge may prepare a draft for the law clerk to critique and complete, or the opinion may be divided into sections, the judge drafting certain parts, the clerk other parts. Whatever the division, the judge has a large hand in the process. But I would be less than candid if I did not acknowledge that as our caseload mounts, the incidents of others writing what appears in print under a judge's name is increasing. I like to write for myself, but I find that still possible only because I need, or at least can get by on, little sleep. In addition to law clerks, most courts of appeals now have staff attorneys who recommend and draft dispositions both of motions and of appeals that are susceptible of summary disposition. The DC Circuit is just now inaugurating a staff attorney's system. It will commence this fall, the fall of 86. We are interested in attracting current third year students or lawyers with some litigation experience. The staff attorney's term will be two years if you or anyone you know might be interested, please contact our Chief Staff Counsel. On the question of style, our complex cases, the pressure of time, anxiety to show that the opinion author really did do battle with a formidable record, and the insecurity or inexperience of law clerks, combined to produce more than occasionally oversized decisions hard on the reader.